Hello everybody and welcome to another Folk Folk Conversation. Conversations with folk about folk. Uh, my name is Katie Spicer and I'm the Chief Executive and Artistic Director of the English Folk Dance and Song Society. And I'm delighted to be joined today by two women, uh, Lucy Ward and Pinky Ward, who I'm told are no relation, but I'm sure they need to get on Ancestry.com and find this out for sure. <laughs> um, but they have very recently set up an online platform which they are calling Thank Folk for Feminism. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But first of all, can I ask you just to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about yourselves as individuals? So Lucy, do you want to kick off? Cool, yeah. So hi, I'm Lucy Ward. I'm a singer, songwriter and, uh, and folk musician based in Derbyshire. I think as a musician, I've spent a lot of time writing about matters of social injustice and kind of through the pandemic had lost my creative flow. So it was really positive for me to find this and create this outlet with Pinky and I'm excited to talk to you about it today. Great. And Pinky, tell us about yourself. Um, yeah, slightly different to Lucy. So I wear a few different hats um, in my day to day life. I'm actually the chief executive officer of a rape crisis centre down in Oxfordshire, um, as well as a consultant to King's College London looking at issues of violence and abuse and mental health. Um, but also come to the folk arena as a fan, as a music journalist, as somebody who has been steeped in the folk industry for the last uh, 30 so years of my life, it turns out. Fantastic. So um, this, uh, this podcast and online forum, Thank Folk for Feminism, is really quite new, isn't it? So do you want to tell me a little bit about, well, I suppose, first of all, how you met? I mean, obviously, there is the folk connection, but you're not, you know, you're working, your day job, so to speak, are in very different areas. So how, how did you actually meet in the first place? <laughs> I think you probably came to review a gig, didn't you, Pinky? Like a million and one years ago. Yeah. Yeah, I think I bowled up to review a gig. Then a little while later approached you to play at my wedding, which was fantastic. Um, and I feel like we've just kind of kept in contact ever since. We bump into each other at Glastonbury. We pop up every now and again to see you perform. Yeah, I suppose it's kind of like one of those relationships that just sort of like bubbled along in the way it does when you're freelance people who live in different counties, you just meet each other. Um, but when Pinky approached me with this idea for the podcast, um, I think really like we just realised that we probably must be related because we're essentially sisters <laughs> and we just had so many things in common. We saw the world in really similar ways, but also, as we said, because we're coming at this conversation with different lenses and different experiences in terms of our work life and our careers, that we just kind of felt like there was really something there to share and to um, where we could facilitate interesting conversations for women in our scene to have. So was there, you say Pinky, you were the one that sort of uh, kicked it off and, and approached Lucy in the first instance, was there a, a particular catalytic moment or what, you know, was there a particular reason that you thought now is, is the time Honestly, no, I'm really good at coming up with slightly harebrained schemes. Um, it was the middle of a pandemic. And so it's really hard, I think, to be, I'm a feminist activist and I want to do stuff to make the world a better place. And it's really hard in the middle of the pandemic to come up with ways and avenues in which to do that. So I started musing about the different platforms you could use and thinking about kind of online content creation. Um, but, but I was really thinking also, I guess, about for me, wanting to get, I sounds really cliche, but get a little bit of the fun back in feminism. So most of my feminist activism is around sexual violence, it's around gender inequality, and it's the sharp end of the stick, I guess. And whilst I think feminist issues are not necessarily quote unquote fun, like, you know, we've had a lot of similar conversations with people on the podcast about violence in the industry or about issues of gender in the industry is coming at it from a completely 
different lens and that's reignited my passion I guess for gender-based rights in a very different way so that felt really important to me that we did something you know we kind of describe it as being a fun uplifting conversation about feminism and I think it's that bit that feels really critical for the work we're trying to do. And so yeah that's that's really interesting I like I like that idea that you wanted to bring the fun into as you say what what at the sharp end can be I, I can imagine you must deal with or I probably can't imagine actually some some of the the, the stories that you hear and, and the and the cases that you're you're probably dealing with that that must be quite something uh, and unfortunately something that probably most of us uh, will never have to experience uh, first hand or second hand um, so what was it what is it about then that the podcast and and the on the forum online that that sort of keeps it you know as you say fun but as i suppose still has that serious element to it it's you know it, it obviously needs to be taken seriously but how how do you how have you gone about that really i suppose i think it's been a really organic process for us and really it's been guided by the women who've contributed so far um, so we kicked off in february and we the first person that we had on the show was the tremendous peggy seeger and uh, that just felt like a real coup for us to get peggy was just wonderful and she had so many insights and and things to share and then um our next main guest that we had the following month we do two podcasts a month so we can showcase smaller artists and women who work behind the scenes but our next big artist that we showcased was nancy kerr mm -hmm on the topic of um, being a mother and a musician and musical heritage and um, and I think probably it was that it was those two conversations that made us realize like the power in this is to follow the lead of the women we're talking to mm. and so that's what made it fun their conversations the women take us where they want to go talk about what they want to talk about and the main focus is them as artists and i think the secondary focus is questions around intersectional feminism whether their gender has ever been a barrier um but we're also kind of considering themes um that uh, that perhaps they're just not invited to speak on in your run-of-the-mill interview with a uh, music magazine or a local radio for example you know we're, we're asking deeper questions and i think that's what leads us to these kind of uh, wider conversations about how we make the folks seem more inclusive how we make it safer for women and indeed everybody and um and uh, yeah so it's been it's been really fun and we've also tried to kind of build in uh, fun segments like i rewrote a traditional folk song with the try to rewrite the the misogyny out of the lyrics basically with ellie reese and uh, we've got ideas about like top 10 feminist anthem rundowns and stuff like that so it's growing and it's changing we're being guided by our listeners they're telling us what they want what they want to hear us talk about and uh, and so you know we we want it, I think the way that it sits in this scene at the moment that is looking rightly at this conversation with tremendous uh, organisations like Bit Collective and Esperance, um, what we do, and this wasn't really intentional, but what we do is we're audience facing the audience are invited into these conversations. It's not about policy and things we can change. It's just about a kind of opening up the conversation about how hard it is for women in our industry and uh, and about celebrating their voices. That's fantastic. And do you, I mean, obviously over the last, what is it now, probably a couple of years really, that, you know, there's been this, um, the, the Me Too, the hashtag Me Too sort of campaign and movement that see, primarily came out of, of the, the sort of acting world rather than, than necessarily the music world. Um, has that influenced you in any way? I mean, consciously or subconsciously to either, you know, go down that route or not go down that route or, you know, how, how do you think your, your, what you're doing is sort of, I suppose, you know, feeding in or has been influenced or is being influenced by the sort of bigger conversations that are happening about particularly women in in the arts sector you know performers etc but i think you know probably the wider the wider picture of women in society full stop 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you can talk about feminist issues without having that conversation. And I actually think it started earlier than Me Too. I think it, yeah. you know, I think historically it started 40 odd years ago, but actually I think the Jimmy Savile stuff was the first point where the public narrative really started to shift. Um, and then the Me Too stuff started to happen. And of course, you know, there's, there's issues with the Me Too stuff in terms of it being attributed to white women rather than it being attributed to Tarana Burke, who is, of course, the woman of colour who started it many moons, actually, before the Hollywood stuff came out. But for me, it's, you know, it's this pyramid structure of inequality that exists, you know, where sexual violence is like right at the top end, right? But all of those microaggressions, all of those day-to-day -day interactions that women experience feed in and facilitate and create a culture that enables that. So the catcalling or just, you know, the fact that spaces aren't considered for women in terms of their safety or in terms of being parents or, you know, that you know, folk music is, you know, deeply misogynistic in most of the lyrics and we stand up and sing that on stage and that's totally fine and nobody bats an eyelid, all plays into that. So for me, you can't have one without the other. But I guess maybe what we hadn't considered was how and how relevant that conversation was going to become mm -hmm. so quickly. Like, actually, it's pretty much the one thing that almost everybody we've spoken to has up on as a key topic for them over the course of you know doing it which as lucy says has only been really a couple of months yeah indeed i mean it is a very short time but you obviously already you know make, making a uh, making a mark really and, and giving giving that that forum isn't it um and and so i suppose yeah i suppose it's my, my also my question is is i suppose again is that sort of worry that we are in a still in a in a situation in the 21st century where we actually need forums for women to to speak on however public they might then end up being as, as yours are they're not private you know you want people to to come and listen to them um but uh yeah it's you know do, do you find that as well a concern well obviously you probably do find that concern but you know um that we are still needing those forms and also i think perhaps needing them in the folk sector which does like to put itself forward as terribly inclusive come one come all doesn't it and you know what 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 do you sort of think about about that as as your position as, as an artist, uh, uh, Lucy, but also Pinky, you, you know, coming in and out as a journalist, as an audience member, and, and now obviously through, through this bigger collaboration. It's interesting because this conversation has come up in almost every interview we've recorded so far, the conversation of the difficulty of addressing issues within a scene that views itself as so inclusive that it actually hurts when people say you might want to consider that we could be making ourselves you know uh more more inclusive or um you know pointing it out rather than assuming it's assumed um even and uh and nancy Kerr said this really interesting thing she said we're a family and in families, it's really hard to talk about problems. And um, and I suppose I can, hadn't really clicked with that notion until she said it. Um, and I, I think we're very keen that the podcast, it isn't about saying everything's wrong. Yeah. It isn't about that. It's about um, giving women in our scene the space to really wax lyrical about their music and their experience and the way that they write and give them um, and give them the space as you say and but we I don't know where I'm going with this I suppose kind of because it's a podcast it it, it needs to be entertaining and I don't mean to the fact that like at the detriment of having the important conversations but I mean like it's it's about uh, oh, where am I going with this? Can you edit this out, Katie? <laughs> I'm sorry, where am I'm I going sorry. With this, Pinky? It's about uh, we wanted it to be somewhere everybody could come because they want to hear 
Nancy or Grace Petrie or Shrewsbury and Cambridge in conversation, not because they're like, I'm a feminist in folk music, but because yeah. they just think these are great artists or powerful organizations and they're interested in hearing more. And I think um, that that really has kind of been my focus of it in terms of being an artist where it can be hard to stick your head above the parapet. I mean, Rachel Newton and Jen Butterworth have spoken about this really openly that, um, that putting their head up with bits collective and speaking really openly about um, gender issues and harassment within the folk scene has meant that some of the focus has shifted away from them as musicians so I think in my mind I wanted there to be a platform where women could speak about these issues but their art was still the center of what we were celebrating um, yeah take it from me pinky because my brain is discombobulated <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think there's also that <laughs> you know, all of that, right? You know, first and foremost, I think we wanted to showcase the voices of women in the industry and give them platform and spaces to speak, particularly when maybe they've not always been given those platforms and places to speak, which is why having two a month and making sure we've got space to showcase newer voices had also felt really important to us. But I think there's also this aspect of the folk scene does consider itself really inclusive, but actually I think it does this thing where it's like, here's the and here's the seat and you have to find your own way to it and actually as a younger woman in the folk industry who's also a lesbian woman I have not found the folk scene to be that inclusive actually I have walked into localized folk clubs and felt very othered and very inside you know because I'm not your stereotypical married middle class individuals you know and i'm not saying that that's all of the folk scene it absolutely isn't you know we know there are as many working class folk in the folk scene as there are middle class people but the the spaces and places i would i was going to mm. didn't feel open to me and it needed something more than just here's a table and here's a seat come and grab it if you wanted it needed that open arms it needed that you know the fact that you know festivals were struggling and not booking prominent outspoken women you know and, and individuals like grace petrie right who is very open about her sexuality and very open about being a political writer aren't always included to the conversation so i think for me there's that aspect as well mm -hmm. of you know i guess building on that family bit you know your third cousin doesn't know to come to the family party unless you phone them up and invite them <laughs> That's, that's such a really, great way to put yeah, it. I think, I think that is a fantastic analogy that, you know, it's a family and it's very difficult to talk about things in families sometimes. I think that's brilliant. I'm going to hold that. Can I? Well, that's Nancy's goal, not ours. <laughs> um, but I just want to jump in here and say that, you know, we're very aware that this um, lack of diversity and representation, of course, extends beyond the gender divide and we're really um mindful that between us you know we're both white women in our 30s but we want the conversation to be um re reflective of what's out there but also to encourage the scene to extend its diversity so you know we we are and uh, showcasing and, and plan to be showcasing we have people booked in down the line showcasing voices of women of color showcasing people who are non-binary showcasing people who are trans you know we want this to be um ultimately a space that that is about inclusion um as much as it is about uh, feminism and and the gender divide but i think what you just said pinky it, it's it's dead right you know I, i've I, I feel that we have two halves in the folk scene. We have a really progressive, liberal, political side. And we also have a side that perhaps even feels that they are that, but there is a barrier somehow to the progression. There's a barrier to um, doing it in a way that it's been done differently before. Um, and I think that, you know, we're in a position to just kind of gently have conversations that allow us to go, well, you know, oh, like what, I'm sure what you just said, Pinky, about not feeling welcome, there'll be people listening to this going, oh, I didn't realize I'd made it feel that way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it, I suppose we're kind of like, uh, perhaps suggesting like mindful interaction 
about who we want there. And all we have to do is look at folk audiences, right, to know that we're not doing enough to make it diverse. Yes. Yeah, ab absolutely. And that's, that's one of the, certainly for us at, uh, at EFTAS, that's, you know, such a big issue, not just for us as an organization, but, you know, for, for the wider sector. Um, and it's, and it is, as you say, it's finding, it's finding artists, it's inviting artists in who, who may not have, you know, grown up in the folk genre, um, but, you know, inviting them in to find out about it, isn't it? And, and helping to get that sort of diversity of people in through that way, which, in itself, hopefully, would then start to lead to a, a greater diversity of all kinds in your audiences. It is that classic thing that you know, marketing people or non-marketing people say, you know, I need to see myself reflected in that organisation to feel that that organisation, or in this case, that music genre, that arts genre, is for me, isn't it? And and you know, you're absolutely right. I think we can't just sit no nobody can just sit there and go but but we're very open you know our doors are open our festivals are open our clubs are open you have to go the extra mile don't you you can't just say of course everybody's welcome artists audiences alike you have to do the things that actually make people feel that they really are welcome and they really can be part of, of, of that of that that group whether it's the artist sector or it's the audience or participating in dances or sing arounds whatever it may be and those things can be incredibly intimidating isn't it when, when you are on the outside for whatever that reason is which could just be you know you you are a sort of white indigenous brit but you've never been to a folk club or a folk festival before or a sing around and that in itself is intimidating to take the first step isn't it mm. but um yeah, there's 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 a lot to um, not quite put right, as you say, but improve and look yeah. at. And I know that's hard because we're a really volunteer run sector, right? But there are other volunteer run sectors who are managing to make yes. these kind of improvements. So we shouldn't use that as our excuse. But I'm just aware that a lot of the spaces that we're talking about, you know, are people that give their time and maybe give as much of their time as they possibly have. And that idea of doing more. But um, the actual bit that I did want to say was we're talking here about how organisations and festivals and folk clubs can make it better. But I imagine the majority of people watching this will actually be folk fans and audience mm -hmm. members mm -hmm. and um we're really uh, keen to always kind of say we say to our listeners you know you do have an effect if there's somebody you want to see booked if there's yes. somebody um yes. you know if you have an idea of how to make things inclusive your demand almost as the consumer of the music can Absolutely. help organizations make these yeah. changes um so you know it, it's about a whole scene approach to creating the change i think absolutely and, and just you know you you uh, pinky you mentioned um you know grace petrie um i remember well it would be two years ago now obviously because we didn't really have any festivals at all last year um but two years ago um i i usually do the comparing on the acorn stage at folk by the oak and grace was one of the artists on there and oh my goodness the tent was packed to the gills several people deep on the side you know trying to sort of look in on the open side everybody was right up the front and everybody and it you know I was looking at the sort of front few people front few rows so to speak you know standing people they were all ages men women you know young children older people you know teenagers young adults they all knew the words to her songs every single word of every single song and if you wanted an example to give to any other promoter whether at a venue or a festival to say this woman is box office oh my goodness you know purely on that you know put aside you know whether the fact that she's she's a great musician or anything like that this woman sells tickets and that should be good enough for you really you know absolutely good enough for you regardless of what her politics or her gender or whatever her platform might be that should be enough for you to say 
wow, she sells tickets, they love her, let's have her in my festival, in my program, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah I think we're, we're all, we're all probably guilty of it, we all tend to sort of get into, you know, into our comfort zones, isn't it, and about what we want, and as you say, Lucy, I think that, you know, dialogue with, with audiences and, um, is, is so important, because I think sometimes we assume that our audiences want certain things or don't want certain, you know, things, certain types of artists will appeal more than others. And sometimes we're not brave enough to go, oh, let's just, let's just try and see, you know, see what happens, you know, and, and sometimes you're really pleasantly surprised about both the numbers, but also importantly, the reaction, you know, people coming out going, oh my goodness, I've never heard that artist before, they're amazing. And, you know, somebody like Grace has, has certainly, it, it, you know, as say my experience at this festival and, and at Cecil Sharp House, that's what people come away with. Oh my goodness, that was amazing. And as you say, gender politics, all that sort of thing, is by the by because they just love what she does and that's that's enough. Yeah. And I actually think there's something, isn't there, about, you know, that aspect of, you know, if you book someone different, you therefore change the demographic of your audience. So that kind of mapping, right? If your audience is one thing and you keep booking more of the same and you, you know, contact your audience and ask them what they want, they'll tell you more of the same. Like, you know, doing the same thing will get you the same results, no yes. questions asked. Yes. If we want to diversify audiences, and I think it's that diversification of audiences that makes people like me feel like this is more of a space where I can come to because I see others like me reflected back yeah. then we have to diversify the lineups which means the people we need to be talking to are the people currently not coming to the festival or coming yes. to the gig who yes. would get you to this space yes and then how do you balance a lineup which gives you you know enough people for those that come year on year on year who are like massively dedicated to that particular festival give them enough stuff that they are engaged and they you know and we all want to see the big names and you know the key players in the folk industry of course we do but then put enough new engaging emerging stuff on to invite a newer different audience in you know and then map what that does for your demographics and your audience you know but if people don't see themselves reflected either on stage or in the crowd they will stop coming and therefore you will get more of the same you know and I guess I was thinking as we were talking actually you know that question of like well how did you and Lucy meet you know part of the reason I would go and watch Lucy play quite a lot is because she's of a similar age to me who sings songs about stuff that's relevant to me mm. you know and so it did feel like a safe space to step into because I did see myself reflected mm. even if it was only on the stage you know even if the audience was still fairly is not really the word you know but it's of a similar ilk to other other spaces you know i was seeing myself reflected somewhere and that feels critical yes mm. and i think probably i should say just to be fair to you know to the folk music sector this isn't uncommon in other music genres i mean you know the sort of pop and rock world are probably one of the you know the few the only sector with perhaps a, a much younger demographic but certainly jazz classical world music you know that we're all having the same conversations about um you know how to how to change that audience demographic including that age issue um but uh, yeah as was just going going back um uh to you know to, to to women in music women in folk music in particular you know there was um oh, well again a sort of couple of years ago um there was some a concern publicly voiced um about programmers attitudes to uh you know say like all female bands and so forth and the the, the whether it was true or not or has just got into the uh, into folklore now of, of the uh, of the promoter or the the programmer saying you know we've already got one of one of you sort of thing when that doesn't appear to be the case with with all male bands do you do you think that is 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 starting to change do you think programmers whether at venues or festivals um or, or folk clubs are thinking a little bit more carefully about you know the the range of artists both in terms of male female gender new experienced new writers very traditional do you think they are starting to think a bit more carefully about that and and not you know always perhaps go for 
the, the people that, as I say, you get into your comfort zone about who you usually book? Um, I think that it's mixed, of course, you know, as the scene catches up together. But we must say that although it has passed into folk mythology, that did happen to the she, didn't it? Um, and we actually interview Bit Collective. There are there are March episodes that people can catch up with, um, and uh, and Rachel talks about that being the catalyst for her work in promoting uh, uh, more uh, gender equality and equity across the scene. Um, I I haven't an inkling a suspicion i don't know if this is right but just from the perspective of being booked and if we look through the lens that perhaps there were three maybe five female-led acts that would headline a big festival mm -hmm. in this country compared to a wealth of other men you know that's already if we just look at the top echelon of artists that we would consider headliners there aren't a lot of women there um and I think that people are concerned. Well, I, my suspicion is that people are led by the music and, th and perhaps feel that if they say like, oh, I haven't got enough women, I need to book a woman, that that would be tokenistic. Mm -hmm. Let me assure you, it's not tokenistic if she's brilliant. <laughs> like, you know, and there are plenty of brilliant, tremendous women to book. And... Um, we spoke to Stevie Smith, CEO of Americana UK, who runs a festival and puts on, has put on many events in her musical career. And she, she put it really bluntly and it was really funny. She said, it's not hard. If you've booked two men, go and book two women. <laughs> it isn't hard. And I think, you know, just literally people having a list and going, yeah, oh, well, all of those men are great, but there's six of them and I've got the rest of the year to program. So I'm going to book six bands mixed gender or you know or women-led or women solo artists perhaps um and and i just think it, it's it's boiling it down to that simplicity and not just going um it's about music and not just music it's music and wow we're trying to work towards this place where we actively are making sure that there is better representation the and needs to be there yeah, I think that that sort of use of, oh, I'm afraid of tokenism can be a marvellous excuse, can't it, not to book, you know, whether it's a female artist or whether it's trying to find, uh, you know, artists of people of colour or specifically booking an artist that their platform is, is gender politics or whatever it might be. It's, it's a marvellous excuse to sort of go, oh, I don't want to be tokenism. But as you say, Lucy, sometimes you actually have to take that step in order to start breaking breaking it down don't you and and uh and starting to open up your your programming and therefore going back to those audiences opening up for audiences as well isn't it um so um what are what are the plans going forward can you give us any any previews sort of sneak preview in information about uh some of the some of the people some of the women that you've got coming up on your podcast podcast for the future Who's going to jump in there? I can jump. <laughs> jump. I just talk for ages. Please jump. Oh, I'll jump. Um, we've got lots of plans and lots of people lined up. So as Lucy said, we've got um, Bit Collective coming up as our April episode. So, yes, April. I said March, um, didn't I? We've just done March. It's all right. Just corrected March you. March was so Bye. yesterday. So, um, <laughs> we are talking to people like Grace Petrie. We've got a festival episode coming up with Shrewsbury and Cambridge Folk Festival in conversation. I'm trying to think what else we've got we've got um more stuff lined up at the end of the year but as lucy said we're also really really keen to make sure that the voices and individuals we've got on the platform do represent a wide range of individuals and so i think one of the things we are thinking really carefully about is the fact that currently our programming um is quite white or is very white everybody we've name checked there is a, a white british woman and we're really keen to step outside of that whilst also recognizing you know there aren't many diverse voices in the folk scene and that makes it difficult. So I guess I would say, you know, we would actively encourage people to contact us um, if they're keen to talk to us, if they can bring a different lens or if people have recommendations or individuals that they think, you know, you've, you've completely missed this person here mm. and you should be approaching and talking to these people.
people please let us know you know we are i think we're acutely aware of our privilege and we're not asking other people to do the emotional labor for us but we also need some support to make sure we get it right yeah and people can find us and to, and contact us through our website which is thankfolkforfeminism.co.uk but we're also on facebook and instagram and twitter and we have um uh, and all the podcast places of course and we also put out a monthly um uh, spotify playlist on the theme of whatever we're um discussing that month so there's uh, there's a lot coming up um and there's a lot of really fun stuff coming up we laugh a lot both me and pinky were saying that it really doesn't feel like work because it's just such a privilege to chat to these ridiculously talented brilliant lovely eloquent people and they enlighten us and they make us smile and you know the feedback that we've had from our audience so far is that they are laughing and smiling and thinking too and um and we couldn't ask for better feedback than that so we want it to grow and we want people to join us and tell us tell us what they want and we will facilitate it because this conversation right is only powerful if we all engage or it's more powerful if we all engage right and at the moment we have about 80 percent to 20 percent women to men listening to us and we think that's really incredible that kind of validating space women ga gathering together and we're very grateful for our listeners uh male listeners and uh, you know non gender non-conforming listeners of course as well um but we do want to talk you know we want to know how why men can't uh, why men might not be listening because this conversation absolutely involves them needs their input um you know and needs their allyship to get the best effects being the gender with the power and the representation to ask for things to be changed in a way a lot mm -hmm. of female artists can't so that's another thing that we just you know we want to know from our listeners how they think we can make it a space that absolutely never loses the focus of women and being women led and being women's voices but also doesn't um uh, you know uh, allows other people to engage yeah I think, sorry pinky I was just going to say I guess the other thing that we're both keen and have frequent conversations about and it's still figuring out and working out the details is we want thank folk for feminism to be bigger than the podcast the podcast is the platform and the talking point um but we're keen you know as i said earlier i'm an activist through and through as is lucy you know and i think we're keen to be agents of change and that means you start with listening and you start with the conversation but what are the next steps and we've talked a lot about you know our capacity or scope to engage with organizations or individuals to create positive change or facilitate panel discussions or you know you name it I think we're probably open to it but you know thinking creatively outside the box particularly as the world starts to reopen about what more we could be doing with Thank Folk for Feminism to really create some positive action. Yeah you, you preempted actually what was going to be my next question is is you know can you can you see yourself doing stuff that's not digital, that's not, you know, but that's in, you know, in person, whether that is, as you were saying, perhaps some panel conversations or, or even programming, you know, your own sort of festival. So we do um, have a dream of that, <laughs> creating our own Thank Folk for Feminism Festival, or at least, you know, at the very beginning, and I'll say this to you as an organiser of events, Katie, uh, you know, jumping into spaces and creating um, a song circle or a day of programming or a block of three hours you know we, we can't we're really interested in that and I think something we didn't mention earlier when we were talking about how we know each other one of the things Pinky said to me when we had our first Zoom meeting about where the Thank Folk for Feminism could even be a thing was I thought about this idea and I thought about who I should ask and I just knew you'd be the person who'd say yes <laughs> And I think we're both the sort of people whose brain is buzzing with places we could take this and we're excited 
to, as Pinky said, to be actively um, doing exciting things for change. And music is a great way to do that without getting bogged down in lots of other things. It's an uplifting practice in itself. Even when it's folk music and the topics are miserable, it's an uplifting thing, isn't it? Mu sharing music and all the more so post pandemic. So yeah, people want to watch out and if they want to book us to create things for them, we're here. Well, my <laughs> My doors, my, my, my personal doors of Cecil Sharp House and Esther's are absolutely open to you. So Cheers. yes, let's pick this up afterwards because I would absolutely love to, uh, love to have you come and do some guest programming at, at, at Cecil Sharp House. That would be absolutely fantastic. So <laughs> that, that's a date. We'll put a date in the diary. Definitely. We'll have to be next year. <laughs> This, this year has got a little bit busy with about three seasons booked back into one season. <laughs> I was going to say, in a month, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Can you do them all? But, but 2022 is a definite possibility. Well, that's been fantastic. And, and we will obviously we'll put the, um, uh, the website address, etc., up at the, at the end of this recording so people will be able to click on it straight away. But it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you both. Um, I think it's it's wonderful uh, what you're doing and, and you know, please carry on and and do take it beyond the digital, you know, out there physically into the world, real world, because, you know, I, I am an older woman. <laughs> I am just a teensy bit older than you guys are, but it is so it, it is so important for you know, uh, the generations below me, uh, male, female black, white, Asian, you know, gender, whatever, to, to be having these conversations and be, be pushing, pushing forward for, for that development. And, you know, we don't necessarily want a revolution, but we do want, you know, a quiet, peaceful, pushing, breaking down a few barriers, changing a few head spaces. Um, it, it is absolutely so important. Thank you both very, very much. Thanks, Katie. Thank you for having us. It's been an absolute privilege to chat. Pleasure.